I'm Jill Morricone, and welcome to lesson number seven of 3EBN Sabbath School panel. This is Indestructible Hope, and I am super excited to get into the Word of God with you at home and my family here on the set. Speaking of my family, to my left, Pastor James Rafferty, so glad you're here. Good to be here, Jill. I have Monday's lesson, which is entitled, Who is Our Father? Amen. My sister, Shelly Quinn, and what's your lesson about? Uh, my lesson is Our Father's Presence, and I can't wait. Amen. My pastor, Pastor John Loma King. And mine is Our Father's Plans for Us. I like How it. amazing can that be? I like that. Amen. Last but not least, Ryan Day. <laughs> so glad you're here. It's a blessing to be here, and mine is Our Father's Discipline. Ooh, I like that. Before we go any further, Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Pastor James, would you pray for us? Sure. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you again for this opportunity to open your word, to ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit to guide our hearts and the hearts of each listener. We pray that blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. This week we're talking about indestructible hope. And you know, there's an old American English proverb that says, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. It means when life becomes difficult, strong people are able to step up and handle it. This is Jill's proverb in light of our title, Indestructible Hope. When life becomes difficult, the questioning begins. Mm. You see, when things go well, when life seems placid or life seems pleasant, it's easy to have hope. But when life becomes difficult, sometimes hope is a hard thing to hold on to. Have you ever questioned your faith? Have you ever questioned the goodness of God? In the crucible, we'll discover this week, it can be easy to misunderstand the character of God. And sometimes we even give trite expressions to kind of placate other people because we're not even sure what to say. The lesson brought out a great story. This is one of C.S. Lewis's books. And it's a story about a make-believe lion. And someone wanted to meet the lion and they said, is he safe? Is the lion safe? Mm. And they were told he's not safe, but he is good. Mm. Even though we don't always understand God, and it might appear that he does unpredictable things, that doesn't mean that God is not good. And that does not mean that God is against us. We simply don't have the full picture yet here on this earth. God is not always predictable, but I want to tell you, God is always love. Mm -hmm. As we understand his character, as we learn to appreciate the beauty of who our father is, we learn that we can maintain hope even in the crucible. Let's look at our memory text. This is Romans 5, verse 5. Romans 5, verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out, King James would say, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I want to read a quote here from Prophets and Kings, page 162, and then we'll jump into Sunday's lesson. Into the experience of all, there comes time of keen disappointment and utter discouragement, days when sorrow is the portion, and it's hard to believe that God is still the kind benefactor of his earth-born children. These are days when it's hard to understand the character of God, days when troubles harass the soul till death seems preferable to life. Could we at such times discern with spiritual insight the meaning of God's providence? We should uh, see him seeking to save us from ourselves, striving to plant our feet upon a foundation more firm than the everlasting hills and new faith, new life would spring into being. That's Prophets and Kings, page 162. Mm. Indestructible hope. Let's look at Sunday, which is the big picture. We're going to the book of Habakkuk. Mm. I like the book of Habakkuk. Thank you, Shelley, for giving me this lesson. Uh -huh. um, we're looking at Habakkuk 1, 2, and 3, which is the whole book of Habakkuk. <laughs> the big picture. <laughs> Um, Habakkuk and Job are both concerned with how God relates to evil. How do we understand the justice of God in a world where there is injustice? Job questions God's fairness by speaking against the injustice of the divinely permitted tragedies that he endured. 
Habakkuk questions God's fairness by demanding that God send judgment on the wicked. Mm. In other words, Job wants God to show his justice by removing negative judgment from the righteous, while Habakkuk wants God to show his justice by sending negative judgment on the wicked. They're almost two sides of the same coin. When we hurt, it's easy to think it's all about us, but it helps sometimes to pull back and look at the big picture. That's what Habakkuk is all about. Now, this is the overall sketch of Habakkuk, then we'll jump into it. So we have Habakkuk's concern, God's answer. Habakkuk's second concern, God's second answer. Mm. And then it finishes with Habakkuk's answer. Mm. We have Habakkuk's first concern, which is God, why are you doing nothing about the wickedness that's going on in Judah. Mm. Why are you doing nothing about the violence? And we'll get into that. Then God answers by saying, uh, -uh I'm paying attention mm. and I'm going to raise up the Babylonians to bring justice upon Judah. Mm. Habakkuk has his second concern. He says, seriously, God, why are you bringing the even more wicked Babylonians to punish mm. the people of Judah? God, I'm not sure I like your justice. And then God answers that second concern. He says, the Babylonians are going to get their judgment too. Mm. Their time is coming. And he also says, it's a twofold answer. He also says, have patience and faith. Mm. Your timetable is not the same as mine. Mm. And then we get to the end of the book of Habakkuk and he gives his answer. God, I'm going to trust you regardless, regardless of the future, regardless of Amen. the circumstances, regardless if I understand completely, regardless if you're even predictable, I know that you are love. So let's look at Habakkuk 1. We're in verses 2 through 4. This is Habakkuk's concern. Why doesn't God bring justice to the widespread wrongdoing and violence in Judah? Mm. So verse 2, he says, Oh Lord, how long shall I cry? That word how long occurs 65 times in the Bible mm. and it usually invites divine intervention. Mm. So it's interesting a lot of the prophets are oracles, right? And God is speaking through them. This book is the prophet complaining to God. Mm -hmm. Seriously, he's talking to God. How long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Now notice the words used here to describe the condition of Judah. For plundering, violence are before me. There's strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless, meaning God's teaching was no longer honored. Mm. It was no longer respected there in Judah. Justice, it never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. So the prophet ends by saying, God, you're either not listening to me or you're somehow indifferent to injustice. You're indifferent to oppression. And we're going to say this a few times this lesson. Lesson, God is not always predictable, but it does not mean that he is not love. Let's look at God's answer. God's answer is that the Babylonians are going to punish Judah. We're in Habakkuk 1 verses, we're just going to read verses 5 through 7. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days, which you would not believe, though we're told you. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans. These are the Babylonians. Now, remember before, God had used what nation to bring judgment to Israel? The Assyrians. That's right, Shelley, the Assyrians. Now, God's saying, not only were the Assyrians brought to bring judgment, I'm going to use the Babylonians to bring judgment to the people of Judah. And then he describes the Babylonian people as bitter and hasty. Mm. They march to dwelling places that are not theirs, verse 7. They're terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and dignity proceed from themselves. So they behave like animals. They're violent. They're ruthless. They're violent. They're proud. And so Habakkuk, this is his second concern. We see this in verses 12 all the way to chapter 2, verse 1. Habakkuk gets worked up and he says, seriously, God? I was upset that you're not bringing judgment there in Judah, but are you going to use the Babylonians to bring judgment? Why are you doing that? The Babylonians are even more wicked than the people of Judah. Verse 12, 
Are you not from everlasting? O God, my God, my Holy One. We shall not die, O Lord. You have appointed them for judgment, O Rock. You have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? So he's saying, since you're holy, God, mm. since you're just, how can you look on while wicked Babylon comes in and defeats, quotes, righteous? Judah. Mm -hmm. And Habakkuk questions God's character. In fact, you get down to chapter 2, verse 1, and what's he say? I will stand on my watch mm -hmm. and set myself on the rampart, and I'm going to watch and see how you answer me, God, mm -hmm. and what I will answer when I am corrected. Mm -hmm. Now, let's look at God's second answer. It's a twofold answer. The first part of that answer is that, have patience, Habakkuk. Have faith. My timetable is not your timetable. Mm -hmm. Verses, we're in Habakkuk 2, verses 2 through 4. The Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tables, that he may run who reads it. Now this has multiple applications here. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Sometimes we need to wait for the fulfillment of God's word or his promise. The righteous live by trusting in God and in His Word. In this case, I know it has multiple applications, but in this case, if you look at what we were just talking about, trusting that God's going to bring the judgment in His time and in His way. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at verses 6 through 17, the rest of that chapter, basically he says the Babylonians, they're going to get their judgment as well. Mm -hmm. Finally, we get Habakkuk's final answer. This is my favorite part of the whole book. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. Though the fig tree may not blossom, mm. nor fruit be on the vines, mm. though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, mm. though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high hills. This is a ringing declaration at the conclusion of the book that God may not always be predictable, but He is always love. Mm -hmm. That you and I can trust our God in the midst of the crucible, in the midst when we might think we don't have hope, when we might think we don't know what's happening, regardless of the future, regardless of your circumstances, regardless even if we understand God completely, we can still trust Him because our God is a God of love. I think this is a, one of the best Old Testament confessions of faith mm -hmm. and trust in the Lord. In fact, I've written in the margin of my Bible these words. When everything seemingly goes wrong, God, I will still praise you. Mm. That's mm. the message That's of it. the book of Habakkuk. Amen. No matter what your crucible, say, God, I will still praise you. Amen. 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 That was an excellent 10-minute summary of the book of Habakkuk. <laughs> oh, I just love that. My name is James Rafferty, and I have Monday's lesson, which is entitled, Who is Our Father? And it is the amazing story of indestructible hope in the experience of Job. The lesson begins by saying, as we know, the book of Job begins with the great personal tragedy for Job. He loses everything except his life and his wife, and she suggests <laughs> that he curse God and die, Job chapter 2, verse 9. And, you know, I can imagine Job, because he's a perfect man, because he's a man after God's own heart, he responds to his wife. He, he comes up next to her. You know, she's lost 10 kids. She's lost all of her wealth. She's lost everything. He puts his arm around her. He says... Honey, you are talking like a foolish woman. You are talking like a foolish woman. We can trust God. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he just has this indestructible hope. But what follows after this is this discussion in which his friends try to work out why this has all happened. Now, really, we understand because the curtains are pulled back. We know Job's story. And at the end, he knew his story. We know his story. Job's story is basically Satan's the one that's coming in. God's giving him permission. He's the one that's coming in. He's doing all this stuff, right? And, you know, Satan fails on this point, and then he fails on this point, And finally, he says, I know what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to bring Job's friends into the scenario <laughs> here. I'm going to get them to come in. And if I can get them to start poking those old questions from seminary, just kind of bringing them out and give them <laughs> a little poke there, then maybe I'll get some action out of Job. And that's exactly what happens. His friends come. They sit silent for seven days, which is probably the best part of their whole experience <laughs> with Job. You yes. know, when people are hurting, they just need us to be with them. They don't necessarily need us to pontificate theologically and explain all of the ins and outs and do's and don'ts and why's and what's. They just need us to, to they just, we just need to be in their presence. Yeah. We just need to, to connect with people who are hurting. And so the book of uh, Job really brings that to us. But then all of a sudden we have this interaction that takes place between Job and his friends and it goes back and forth, back and forth. You know, we're familiar with Job 1, Job 2 and Job 42, but all the stuff in the middle, mm -hmm. that stuff is kind of like, what is going on in all of that? Well, basically what's going on is Job's friends are trying to convince him one after another yeah. that he's done something to deserve all of this suffering that's coming upon him, that, that he's out of harmony with God, that he's got some kind of secret sin because in this theological paradigm, if you suffer, if you lose, if you are going through a it's because you are not doing something right with God and God is punishing you. And in a sense, that story is the, the picture that God has given to us and given to the whole world to help us to understand the cross, to help us to understand Calvary. You see, if the Jews would have understood the book of Job, they would have understood Christ and they never That's would right. have assumed that God is doing this to, for, to him and he deserves all of this and whatever punishment's coming to him right now is an evidence that he's not God's prophet, he's not the Messiah, right? If they would have got the lesson of Job, the lesson of Job that Job that finally comes out is, you know what? Sometimes good people suffer mm -hmm. even though they're good. Yep. Yeah. Sometimes God's people suffer even though they're following God. Right? Mm -hmm. And Job's argument, his counter argument to that, of course, is, well, you know, there's a lot of wicked people in this world that aren't suffering at all. You know, could it right? be that wicked people who aren't suffering, that there's good people who sometimes suffer? Anyway, we don't want to get off guard here. We want to get to the very end of the chapter because in the lesson, we're, we're directed to chapter 38 where suddenly God appears. He's been quiet this whole time. And sometimes when we're in the crucible, um, it seems like God is quiet. It seems like God doesn't say anything. And it's in those times that we actually have an opportunity to grow. And let me tell you something, Job is going to grow through this whole experience. And the kind of growth that he has is the kind of growth God wants for us. And so God appears and he says, who is this? Verse uh, two of Job chapter 30. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge, right? That's the NIV. And then he, he drops, according to the quarterly, he drops, God asks some 60 draw dropping questions. <laughs> and if you open your Bible, it says you can read through chapters 38 and chapter 39. And after the last question, Job replies, and he says, I'm unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hands over my mouth. I spoke once. I have no answer twice, but I will say no more. <laughs> That's Job chapter 40 verses four and five NIV. But God isn't finished. The quarterly goes on to explain. He then begins again and asks another set of big questions in succession. And as he asks these big questions in succession, Job has a final response. And that's what we're going to go to. We're going to go to Job chapter 42. He has a final response. And, and the context of this, the question that's asked in the quarterly is, what was God trying to tell Job and what was the effect on him? Hmm. And I believe that God was trying to help Job to understand the only thing that can really answer our question about sin and suffering and pain, hmm. about all of the wrongdoing on planet Earth. And God was trying to say, Job, You've got to look at me. Yeah. You've got to know me. You've got to understand me. You've got to understand my connection with every part of my creation. You've got to know that when a bird falls, you've got to know that when a horse gallops, you've got to know that when the lightning, uh, the thunder claps, the lightning uh, flashes, you've got to know that I'm connected to all of that. Nothing in this world takes place. This world is a vast laser house. And I see everything and I know everything and everything that happens. The pain that you feel, you've just entered into my pain, just a little bit of my pain. Yeah. The sorrow that you feel, the separation that you feel, all of that is felt in my heart. Mm -hmm. Look at how I am connected with all of creation. Job, he's saying, whoa, yeah. 
<laughs> you know, this is amazing. Of course, yes, I see it now. God is connect God is giving Job the answer that Job needs in a revelation of who he is. And that, my friends, is always the way that God is going to answer us. In fact, Calvary is the fullest revelation yes. God can give us yes. of That's who right. he actually is. Right. And that is the full that full revelation is the one thing that answers all of our questions about God. Now, there are times when we have these questions, you know, that are so it's People think, oh, I've got a question God can't answer. Let me tell you, <laughs> it's not wisdom. It's not necessarily a sign of intelligence to ask uh, an intelligent question, a difficult question. A three-year-old can ask a difficult question. It's the answers that matter. Mm -hmm. And God is wise enough. God is intelligent enough. He can give us the answers we need, and He gives them in a revelation of who He is. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this man in the land of us whose name was Job, that word Job, by the way, means hated. That's what the word means. It means hated. You mean we could read that verse. There was a land in the a man in the land of us whose character was hated. And who was he hated by? He was hated by the devil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We see that in the story, right? Mm -hmm. Why was he hated by the devil? Because he was like God. Well, what, what was his perfection? You know, it says he was. What was his perfection? Well, he prayed for his kids. Why? He did. Well, he was afraid they weren't following the Lord. He was afraid that they weren't good kids. He he prayed for his kids not because they were good, but because he was afraid they weren't good. And he would get up early in the morning. He would offer sacrifice. He would give his stuff, his time and his stuff for his kids. And Satan says, whew, I got to do something about that. I got to do something about these praying people. I got to do something about people who pray for people who aren't worthy to be prayed for. I got to stop this. People are going to start thinking that God is like that, right? Mm -hmm. And so he comes in and he tries to dismantle Job. And when he gets to the end of the story, Job's like, you guys are worthless physicians. You are miserable comforters, right? <laughs> and, and, and he just says, be quiet and that will be my comfort. He's talking to his friends. And Job, when God comes on the scene and God reveals himself to Job, God says now um, to his friends, now he says, you guys haven't spoken that which is right about me like my servant Job has. Mm -hmm. So there was something Job was saying that was actually right about God's character. You haven't talked what is right like my servant Job. Now. <laughs> Job, I want you to go to Job because Job is going to pray for you. Yeah. That's a statement of faith. Yeah. That's the faith of Jesus Christ. Job is going to pray for you. And you know, after this full revelation, Job does. He, he matures in his experience with God. He steps into a greater experience of prayer. He's not now only praying for his kids because he's mm -hmm. not sure about them. His flesh and blood, those that are... He's praying for his miserable, comforter, worthless physician friends. Mm -hmm. That's where God takes him because when you see a bigger picture of God, it takes you to a whole new level mm -hmm. of how you relate to people who hurt you. And mm -hmm. these friends had hurt Job, but Job got this bigger picture of God and he saw God's connection. It was answered. The answers came and the answers always come, friends, when God reveals a picture of himself. So here's what we see in this very last chapter, chapter 42. It says here, so verse 7, it was so that after the Lord spoke these words unto Job, the Lord said unto Eliphaz the Timonite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for you have not spoken of me the thing that was right as my servant Job has. Mm -hmm. Now go and take sacrifices, etc. So Eliphaz went and, and uh, took sacrifices, and it says, and, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my verse 8, My servant Job shall pray for you, mm -hmm. for him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that you have not spoken of me the thing that is right, like my servant Job. And then the Bible goes on to say um, that in verse 10, it says that the Lord turned the captivity of Job when Job prayed for his friends, and also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. See, God wants to turn our, our captivity. Mm -hmm. And many times we're captive to bitter thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, we're hurt by people that are close to us, who misunderstand us. Maybe they don't know our, our troubles, our difficulties, our trials, what we're really going through in our heart. And they say things, and they don't mean to say them, you know, they're, they're theologically, you know, oh, you know, this is what we learned and this is what the, you know, and it hurts. And, but God wants to give us the victory over that pain and the victory over that hurt. He wants to turn the captivity of our own bitter thoughts as we see a bigger picture of who he is. Amen, that's beautiful. beautiful. I love that. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. We're going to take a short break and be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. 
A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our continued study on indestructible hope, and we're going to pass it over to Shelley Quinn. Thank you, Jill, for Habakkuk study. Thank you, James, for the study on Job. I have something a little more general, and Tuesday's lesson is our Father's presence. I'm Shelley Quinn, and I can't wait to get into this. You know, King David, as you read the story of his life, he was often in the crucible. Mm -hmm. I think the boy felt fried half the time. <laughs> but in Psalm 69, let's, let's look at that. Psalm 69, one through three, David is crying out to the Lord. And he says, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. Have you ever felt like, mm -hmm. oh, don't make a wave or I'm going under because the waters are so high? Mm -hmm. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. He felt like he was on quicksand. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow mm -hmm. me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Have you ever been like David, where you're in such a problem, such a crucible, that your psychological pain is causing you mm. great suffering. Mm. You feel desperate. Even physical exhaustion is what he's expressing here. But now jump down to verse 16. Well, first of all, let me ask you this. Yeah, no, I'll do this. Psalm 69, 16. Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness. That's his mm -hmm. has said. Yeah. That's his grace, his faithfulness, his unconditional love, his mercy and kindness. He says, your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Do not hide your face from your servant, mm -hmm. for I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. Heed me speedily. Let me ask you at home. Have you ever prayed and you're in a desperate situation and you feel like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling? Mm -hmm. Have you ever become just so discouraged mm -hmm. that you begin to develop a low opinion of yourself? God must not think I'm mm -hmm. very important. He's not answering me. Sometimes people get in that situation and they feel deserted by God. But let me tell you something. If you are God's child, He is with you always. Right. Hebrews 13, Amen. 5, God says, right. I will mm -hmm. never leave you nor forsake you. Mm -hmm. That is covenant love language. Mm -hmm. Now, this is interesting. When I see somebody going through a struggle, my sincere prayer is I, I say, God, give them a divine awareness of your presence. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes me a little... Uh, irked is not the right word, but sometimes you hear people say, oh, be with so-and-so, be with so-and-so. Well, God says, I'll never leave you or forsake mm, you. We right. don't have to pray for him to be with. I'm praying, Lord, give him a divine awareness mm. of your presence, a supernatural experience and awareness. And you know, God's not light years away from us. Mm -hmm. He's right there. He, he lives in us by the, His Holy Spirit. Christ lives in our hearts by faith. But let me tell you something that's so funny. When I was had gone through my two surgeries and I can't take pain pills. I'm allergic to everything. Mm -hmm. So I'm going through two major surgeries, no pain pills. And the pain was mind numbing. Mm -hmm. And I found myself in my recliner chair, looking out the window and I'm praying up to the sky. I, I'm praying like God is way up there. Mm -hmm. And I hear this little whisper, I'm right there with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shelly, you don't have to look out the window <laughs> like I'm some light years away. <laughs> Thank you. Here I am. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, 
God gave me what I prayed for everyone else, mm -hmm. a divine awareness mm -hmm. of His presence. You know, we know the Bible says that He is in our hearts, but that doesn't make us always feel close to Him. Mm -hmm. But suddenly it was like He's sitting in the next chair that I could touch Him. Amen. And, and it was just so, His presence mm -hmm was so tangible. Yeah. He was my constant companion mm. through all of this. And I found myself talking to him throughout the whole day. And I mean, if, if I was talking to somebody and said, yeah, I'll pray for that. It's like, okay, Lord, we're praying for this right now. Wow. I mean, it, you know what? God's so good during my whole experience. He kept having people who are in trouble call me so that I can minister to others. And there is a, that's healing. So Isaiah 43, one through two, God promises to be with his covenant people. But now, Isaiah 43, verse one, thus says the Lord who created you, fear not for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. Hey, when you're in covenant relationship with God, when you are his child, he knows you by name. He says, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you just as he was with Moses and the Hebrew children as they crossed through the Red Sea. He says, when you walk through the fires, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you, just as he was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He could bring you out to the other side. Mm -hmm. You're in this fiery trial. He'll bring you out not smelling like smoke. Please hear what I'm saying. God's not far away. He's close enough to hold your hand. That's right. mm -hmm. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Mm -hmm. He says, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed. Mm -hmm. I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Mm -hmm. I will uphold you mm -hmm. with my righteous right hand. Now, here he was speaking is speaking to his covenant people and, and he's trying to strengthen them mm -hmm. and he's letting them know, I'm going to get rid of your enemies. I mean, they, they were in exile. They felt very mm -hmm. far away. But listen to what he says in Isaiah 41, 13. He says, for I, mm. the Lord your God, will hold your right hand saying to you, fear not, I will help you. They are eagerly awaiting for future deliverance. And God's promise is what? I'll strengthen you. I'll rescue you. And guess what? It's the same for us today. Mm. That is God's covenant promises. You belong to him if you're in covenant relationship. You know what? Sometimes people will say, oh, I, I just feel like I'm barely holding on to Jesus. I want to encourage you. When you feel like you're barely holding on, know that he is holding on to you. That's right. And when you get so weak, you feel like you can't take another step. Mm -hmm. Guess right. what? He swoops in with those everlasting arms mm -hmm. and he picks you up and Amen. he carries you. Deuteronomy mm -hmm. 33, 27. The eternal God is your refuge mm -hmm. and underneath are the everlasting arms. He'll thrust out the enemy from before you and will say, destroy. Now, I have to do this. I believe in a balanced teaching and I'm telling you, God will never leave you or forsake you. Mm. But there is a caveat. In 2 Chronicles 15, 2, we got to have the balance. Mm. The Lord is with you while you were with Him. Mm -hmm. If you seek Him, He will be found by you. But if you forsake Him, mm. He will forsake you. He's not going to right. push His presence mm. on you. Yeah. So if you feel like there's a distance between you and God, it's not God who moved. Mm. You moved. When you turned your back mm -hmm. and walk, started walking in the other direction, but you know, we looked at, at in the Psalms mm -hmm. where David is saying, oh, your has said, your loving kindness, your grace, your agape, your mercy has pursued me. It mm -hmm. follows me, Psalm 23, mm -hmm. all the days of my life. God 
will pursue you. And I speak from personal experience because I got so upset with God because of a bad teaching on faith, because he did not heal my mother. I shook my fist in God's face mm -hmm. and said, you don't keep your promises. Mm -hmm. And I walked away from God. And it was a couple of years, mm -hmm. but I guarantee you, God pursued me. Mm -hmm. And now I, every day it's part of my prayer for myself. I pray it for others, but now I say, Lord, give me a divine awareness of your presence. Mm -hmm. You're right here with me right now. And he is with you if you're his child. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Shelley. Great foundation when we talk about how we can find hope in God. And this, what you said, lays a perfect foundation for the segue into this lesson, Our Father's Plans for Us. Mm -hmm. You know, there are many people today that are looking for hope. They're looking for hope in financial places. They're looking for hope in other people. They're looking for hope in friends. Some people are looking for hope in their careers. And some people are looking for hope in their marriages. Hope you have hope there. Praise God, I do. But there's a hope beyond just the things that man can provide for other human beings. And we find that in God. Amen. You know, we find in, in Psalm 137, and, and God often reveals hope to us in the midst of our dilemma. Jill, if you could read Psalm 137, verse one for us. This is a picture that God gave. You find this in the book of Jeremiah, and I'll share with you in a moment, how everything that happened to Judah, to Israel, wasn't something that caught God by surprise, but when they were in captivity, listen to their moaning in this text. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Mm. Wow. So here they are in captivity in Babylon. And when I read about the story, my wife and I are in the book of Jeremiah. It's really, uh, it, it says so much about Babylon and Jeremiah, noticing that when we read Daniel alone, we think that somehow Judah was taken captive against the will of God. But that was not the case. It was because of their rebellion and their recalcitrance that God allowed them. He said, you're not going to live like Babylon in Jerusalem. Mm. So you're going to go where you're going to enjoy the lifestyle that you've chosen. And we find in Jeremiah chapter 29, we're going to look at the forecast of them going in and then God giving them hope in the midst of their captivity. Jeremiah 29 verse 1, I'm going to read verse, verse up to verse 4. I'll exclude verse 3, but just follow me carefully. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now go verse 4. Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. He said, hey, you're there because I've caused you to be there. And then verses five down to verses nine, he says, while you're there, just have children, buy houses, buy land, mm. get, be married. And if there are prophets that are coming from Judah that tells you your captivity is going to end soon, don't listen to them. They are falsely prophesying in my name. I have not sent them. But in the midst of their dilemma, look at verse 10. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are complete at Babylon or completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform what? My good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. I want you to grab that. He caused them to be carried in. He's going to cause them to come out and restore them to their former state, even better than before. So whenever you're facing a dilemma, just remember this. It doesn't catch God by surprise. God told them they were going to be in captivity. He ordained it. God told them how long they were going to be there, the nation that was going to hold them into servitude. But he said, when 70 years are done, you're going to go back home. You're going to be able to sell, buy, reestablish yourself. Mm. Nothing catches God by surprise. Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10, we know that the future of every Christian is not by prophecy or speculative theology, wealth, fame, or fortune, but by the will of God. Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none like me. I, I am God and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Mm. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying what? My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Meaning mm. God is going to do everything that he has intended to do and no 
prophet or president or prelate or priest can change God's plan. Mm. We find in the Bible this phrase, 176 times we find this phrase, it came to pass. Mm. I love that, it came to pass. Why does it come to pass? Mm. John 14, verse 29, notice. And now I have told you before it comes. Mm. John 14, 29, I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Mm. So the Lord is saying, you think I don't know what's coming? When it comes and it passes, I hope you believe. Mm. Many things happen. So that's why we believe that the Lord is coming again because prophecy, Ryan and all our panel, God has told us what's coming. It came, it passed, and we know that God's word is sure. Mm. Isaiah 49, verse two, behold, the former things have come to pass and new things I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Amen. That's the God I want to serve. Not a God of guessing, not a God who says, what do we do now? But a God who says, I knew it was coming and I've got plans for that. Joshua 21, verse 45, everything that God plans come to fruition. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Yeah. That's God, that's, that's God. Nothing catches God by surprise. Even our birth, and this is amazing because I believe that God knew before I was born that my mother was going to abandon me and my father was going to abandon me. I, I believe God knew it. And I believe that God allowed it to happen so that my life can turn out to be where I am today. Because my mom told me this when I met her after almost 26 years. She said, if I raised you, you would not be what you are today. Mm -hmm. So God, what sometimes begin as a tragedy turns out to be a triumph. God sees our plans and he says, this one is for me. And the lady that was raising me, she says, this child is mine. I'm gonna raise him to know the Lord. And that's why I am where I am today. Mm. But that was true about Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1 verse five, the Bible says, before I formed you in the womb, mm. I knew you. Before you were born, mm. I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Mm. I choose to believe my life as a part of a divine plan, Amen. not a divine coincidence. Mm -hmm. Also in Daniel chapter two, verse 28, this is why we have confidence in prophecies. He says, but there is a God in heaven mm -hmm. who reveals secrets, Daniel told to Nebuchadnezzar, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. He says, you had a dream. God even knew your dream. Mm. That's how God is. And so we find these three things. God tells us before it comes to pass. So when it happens, we understand that we can trust the word of God. Secondly, God told the Israelites and Judah that you'll seek peace and prosperity where I have carried you and you'll have it. But when that exile is done, you'll have peace and prosperity where you used to be. Mm -hmm. And God alone made that come to pass. But let me just take a shift now because there's some people that think that God called them to church membership when really, in fact, he called them to Christian craftsmanship, mm. Mm. not membership. Good. A lot of people come to be members, but they stop there when God says, I want you to be Christian craftsmen. Right. Not membership, but craftsmanship. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 10. Mm. Here's what we like, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We like to stop right there. I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, we say, but God says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't get comfortable. I've got jobs for you. You know, before any of us came to 3ABN, God knew exactly what we would do when we got here. Mm -hmm. Craftsmanship, Christian craftsmanship. And he says in verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created for craftsmanship, <laughs> created in Christ Jesus for good works, get this, which God prepared beforehand mm -hmm. that you should walk in them. Mm -hmm. So the Christian life is one of hope, one not of speculation, but of promise, one where God prognosticates and then brings it to pass. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14, here's our favorite passage. God says it and it happens exactly the way he says it. For I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace Amen. and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. This was being said to Judah when they were in Babylon. Mm. This is what God was saying, you're gonna be out of here. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, 
and watch this, and I will bring you back from your captivity. Mm. You know, if you have a son or daughter that's still in the captivity of sin, mm. hold on to that promise. God is not okay. done with them yet. Mm. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. Mm -hmm. Let me just let you know, there's somebody here like me, I'm praying for my sister after 30 years, left the church at 16, she's 66 now. Ooh, that's, that's a long, that's 50 years. Mm -hmm. She's not back yet, but I'm holding on to God's promise because God had to get Babylon out of her before he can get her into Jerusalem. If you're praying for someone, hold on mm -hmm. because God's plans are great. He has plans not only for your children, but also for you. Hold on to those plans. Amen. Mm. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor, and the rest of the panel. Powerful setup for a great ending on Thursday, which is entitled Our Father's Discipline. My name is Ryan Day. And you know what? I love how this particular lesson was written because it reminds us of that God is not just a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. Mm. Yeah. But his justice is not our type of justice. His discipline isn't always our choice or our type of discipline. Mm. You know, it, it kind of starts off by reminding us of what we find in the latter chapters of Hebrews. Uh, of course, Hebrews chapter 11 is the great faith chapter. It has that great faith hall of fame. As you're looking at these brothers and sisters who have went through a lot, they have been through a lot of different crucibles. They have been tested. They have been tried. They have been challenged, but yet they were faithful and endured all the way to the end. That by the time you transition to the 12th chapter of Hebrews, this is where the author of the lesson takes us to because we find some powerful counsels coming on the tail end of, of Hebrews 11, having seen all these brothers and sisters who persevered to the end. Now we find, of course, the first two verses. We love them. It's one of my favorite verses, uh, but it, it, it's a continuance of the previous chapter. Mm. And he goes, goes on to say in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, the cloud of witnesses being those from chapter 11, mm. it says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And then I love verse two. How do we do this? How can we make sure that when we face these trials, that when we face these challenges, when we, are, when we find ourselves in a crucible, how can we make sure that we approach it in a spiritually mature manner? Verse two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I love that. Looking unto Jesus. Mm -hmm. Many people fail to understand where they are in life or, under, or fail to understand God's plan for their life. Even the tough moments, even the trials, even the tribulations, the challenges, the despairing times in their life, it's hard for them to see past the dark clouds. It's hard for them to see past the valley, uh, the, 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 the valley of the shadow of death because they're not looking into Christ. They're not looking to, uh, to, to the ultimate prize, which is Christ's righteousness. I think of right there in, in John chapter three as Jesus is having this deep, deep, spiritual conversation with Nicodemus ultimately in that incredible conversation that they're having about salvation, about how Jesus has come to, set him, to, 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 to give him a new heart and to make him born again. Right there in verse 14, what does he say? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, mm -hmm. so shall also the Son of Man be lifted up. It draws our attention back to that Numbers chapter 21 story in which all the snakes are going throughout, biting the children of Israel. Talk about a challenge. Talk about about a fearful time. Talk about a moment when you really, really need a savior. What was the answer? Mm. Look, yeah. there's life in a look. And so the lesson brings out if we just often just if when in these moments where we're being tried, where we're, we're walking or, or dwelling in the refining fire, mm. if we keep our eyes fixed on Christ, Christ will see us through. Mm. But then comes verses three through 13, which is the counsel that we receive on how to approach the discipline of our father. So let's read verses three through 13. It's powerful words here. Again, we're in Hebrews chapter 12, starting here with verse three. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Mm. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten, uh, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. And this is God speaking to His people. And what does He say? My son, 
do not despise the chastening mm. of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. I love that. I love that. It constantly, we are constantly reminded that God's discipline is not a man type of discipline. Yeah. Oftentimes we discipline out of anger. Mm -hmm. We discipline out of, you know, irritation or disappointment or whatever it may be. But there's, there's feelings and, and thoughts associated with that discipline that is not necessarily holy, that is not mm -hmm. necessarily of the character and the mind of Christ. God reminds us here, look, don't despise my discipline. Don't despise my chastening because notice verse six, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Why does he do it? He does it with love. It, was, it reminds me of Revelation chapter three, verse 19, as he's speaking right there to Laodicea. What does he say? As many as I I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. God does not discipline us because he finds pleasure in it. It reminds me, we've read it here a couple of times already, Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, as God is pouring his heart out to Israel, he's pouring his heart out to his people. And what is he saying? What is he saying? He says, verily I say unto you, let's read that here. He says, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye, for why should you die? It's, it, God, you can also put it in there. God is saying not only that, uh, that he does not look or, or, uh, or love the destruction of the wicked, but rather also it was never God's plan for us to struggle, for us to, uh, for us to suffer, for us to have all of the pain and the suffering and all of those things. That was not his original plan, although sometimes he allows us to endure that in the crucible, in the discipline, in the structuring of our life, but it was never his plan, but rather he allows us to endure these things, not because he finds pleasure in it, but because he loves us, because through the refining fire, through the, the, the soap that he's going to cleanse our life with, it's going to make us better in the end. We're right, right, right back in Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to start with verse 7 and continue on. It says, if you endure chastening, mm -hmm. God deals with you as with sons for what son is there whom a father does not chasten mm -hmm. but if you are without chastening of which all have become partakers then you are illegitimate and not sons mm -hmm. furthermore he says we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect mm -hmm. shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live right for they indeed for a few days chasten us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. I love that. And I love verse 11 as it continues on. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, afterward, mm -hmm. it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, strengthen the hands of which hang down and feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, mm -hmm. but rather be healed. In other words, God is saying, look, don't resist. Allow me to discipline you, my son, and don't, don't hate the discipline. As, as James Wright, take, take joy in the various trials because God is preparing us. He is shaping and molding us for the kingdom of God. You know, it's interesting because it makes mention here that about the likening uh, the discipline of the father to his children, you know, like our earthly fathers, our earthly parents. I remember my parents used to set me down oftentimes after I had just received a, a good whipping. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they would set me down and they, and, and oftentimes my mom, mother in tears would sit and tell me, son, do you know why I had to do that? Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in my little bitty adolescent mind, oftentimes I didn't quite understand it because in my mind I thought you're mean, you know, mama's being mean, daddy's being mean. <laughs> but they would explain to me, I do that because I love you. You may not understand it now, but as you get older, you will. And mm -hmm. praise God. That is the truth. I never once sensed that my parents were disciplining me because they hated me. I now at a mature age, understand that they were doing that to shape and mold me to be a better man and to help me walk in the ways of righteousness and the ways of the Lord that God wanted me to be. That's why Proverbs chapter 22, verse six says, train up a child in the way they should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Mm -hmm. That is God's plan for our life. But yet oftentimes we have many people 
uh, that they kick against the discipline of God. They even, even in today's time, we have people kicking against the disciplining of children. Mm. Parents don't even, ch- don't even parent their children correctly or discipline their children correctly because it's looked down on mm. in these day and age. That's why Proverbs 12, one always gets me. Uh, whoever loves instruction loves knowledge. But, and this is New King James Version, by the way, but he who hates correction is stupid. Mm. (laughs) That's what it says. Mm. Whoever loves instruction, loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. That's not my words. That's the Bible word. I think the King James says brutish. Same concept. Mm. It's ignorant. It's stupid. When you reject the discipline of your father, my friends, it's not a good thing. That's why I love the song. It's an old song I used to sing years ago. Mm -hmm. Potter mold me Mm. till I'm true. Jesus, make me just like you. Anything, Lord, to be a vessel for your anointing. I love that. Part or break me even more. Bend me, Jesus, till you're sure. You'll be proud to bring this worthless vessel home. God is the potter. We are the clay. Allow him to bend you so that you might be able to stand confident when he comes. Amen. 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 I always love it when you sing. Thank you, Mm -hmm. Pastor Ryan, Pastor John, Shelley, and Pastor James. Mm -hmm. As we talk about indestructible hope, give each one of you a moment for a final thought. Just a thought from the lesson quarterly. I really love this question. Are the things you just can't understand happening now? If so, focus on the character of God. Mm, I'm just going to read something from the quarterly. It says over the next few days, try and experiment at every moment possible. Try to remind yourself that the God of the universe is close enough to you to hold your hand and is personally promising you help. Keep a record of how this changes the way Mm. you live, and it will. That's right. You know, when we think about God's goodness is much better than our badness, (laughs) and His best is so much greater than our worst. Mm -hmm. He's planning a future more glorious than your past, and His high much greater than your last. So trust Him Mm. with your every moment, and it will come to pass. Amen. Amen. On that same point, just echoing what I read earlier from Revelation 319, Jesus says, as many as I love, I rebuke, and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Jesus knows you better than you know you. Just surrender to him and say, Lord, have your will with my life. Amen. 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 This has been an incredible study. I want to leave you with Psalm 42, verse 11. As we think about indestructible hope, why are you cast down, O my soul? Do you feel cast down today in your circumstances, in your crucible? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I will yet praise him. He is the help of my countenance and my God. So extend your gaze upon Jesus and hope in him. Join us next week, lesson number eight, Seeing the Invisible. God bless you. Yeah.